All right, welcome everyone. We're so happy to have you here. My name is E.R. Anderson, and I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We've been around for 45 years. Uh, we are currently not open to the public, but um, we are open online 24-7 and shipping out seven days a week. So we're doing our best to stay connected with all of you through the COVID-19 crisis. And one of the ways that we're doing this is by having wonderful digital events. We've been so honored by the authors who have agreed to jump into this new frontier with us um, and to try out our new digital platform. Um, we're so used to fostering community in person. We really believe in that. We think it's really important. But we also have been really happy with um, this experiment that we're doing. Uh, we hope that some of you are um, watching from places other than Atlanta. We hope that maybe you're watching from around the world, possibly some of you in India where it's uh, morning and breakfast time. Um, we hope that uh, if you learn something uh, you know, tonight and you want to know more, we would love for you to, to find out more about Keras Books because we do ship globally. We want to foster um, sustainable feminist community around the world. I see somebody's watching from New York City, so that's wonderful. We'd love for you to chime in about where you're watching from. Um, and we want to be, you know, we want to take advantage of the fact that this moment is offering some good things uh, in addition to, to the scary things and the challenging things. So thank you for being here. We're really thrilled. Um, I want to introduce uh, our panelists today. So first, I'm going to introduce our, our moderator and our interviewer, who is journalist Gail O'Neill. Um, Gail is the co-creator of Collective Knowledge and is a regular contributor to Arts ATL. Following graduation from Wesleyan University, New York native Gail O'Neill began a successfully successful modeling career that has taken her around the world. She's been on the cover of magazines like Mademoiselle and Vogue and featured in advertisements for numerous companies as well as catalogs ranging from J. Crew to Nordstrom. O'Neill started her journalism career as a freelance reporter for several television networks, eventually becoming a features correspondent for CBS's The Early Show. The opportunity to host CNN's weekly Travel Now series lured her from the Big Apple to Atlanta, where she currently lives. We're thrilled to have Gail here. Um, and if you don't know her collective knowledge um, series, that is also a digital um, series that you can access on YouTube. So this is a great moment to go back and catch up on those interviews. It is, um, it's a really special um, series and a great way to kind of learn more um, from the comfort of your home. Thank She's you. here today with Ruby Lau. Ruby is an acclaimed historian of India. Empress, the astonishing reign of Nur Jahan, won the 2019 Georgia Author of the Year Award in biography and was also a finalist in history for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Among the top 10 pick of the Time Magazine, the Telegraph and the Prospect Magazine, London, Empress has been lauded by the New Yorker, the Guardian, New York, the New York Times, the BBC, the Indian Express, Business Standard, and numerous other national and international journals, magazines, and newspapers. She is a professor of South Asian history at the Emory University and divides her time between Atlanta and Delhi. So please welcome journalist Gail O'Neill to interview and be in conversation with Ruby Lau. Thank you, ER. You're welcome. Ruby, I'm curious. I'm going to go back to something ER said. We're all in this time of communicating virtually now. You've already spent well over a year traveling the world to talk about Empress. So what is it like doing this virtually, knowing you have an audience out there? I know we have people visiting from Asia, from North America, South America, Europe. You can't see them, but you know they're there. Yes, um, but first of all, thank you, Karius, and thank you, Gail and Iyar, for, for being here with me. Um, I also want to say a big thank you to Gabby Nugent, my publicist. I know she's worked very hard to get all of us together. Um, it's lovely. I think we can still do it. It's great, uh, you know, that uh, there is a chance to interact and to talk and perhaps to, um, you know, bring together people who wouldn't uh, otherwise be able to come. Uh, I think that's the great opportunity. But uh, I was saying to ER, you know, what I really miss, what I really loved being on the road was um, hanging out afterwards uh, while signing books. All sorts of things happened. Uh, you know, that touchy-feely human feeling. I think we're all missing that. Uh, so so this is 
this is wonderful. Wonderful that I can see you. Wonderful uh, that we can talk still, uh, at least view from a distance. Um, but there's something lovely to that uh, other time. Yes, it, and it is another time, isn't it, Ruby? It's incredible to think it's only been six weeks and yet it feels like another world. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't start off by talking about a giant of cinema that we lost last, last week, Irfan Khan. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that you, as a lover of stories and storytelling, are a movie fan. And if so, is there something you'd like to say about what his legacy is to India, to the world, and to cinephiles? Yeah, um, a great, great, I think um, uh, it feels like a huge ditch, uh, if you will. You know, it's not just a simple loss. Um, I think um, what I loved most about Irfan Khan was really how he brought storytelling to cinema. I mean, there's a, there's a magic that he, that he yarned while he, while he acted. And I think of Lunchbox as one of those really incredible films in which, um, you know, he was the actor, the story was lovely. It was love, it was, uh, you know, uh, incredible initiative, it was playfulness, but you all felt roped in, right? Always. Uh, was, you always felt roped in. And I think that, that is the power of storytelling, that it's, it's not just on the, on the pages, it's not just on the screen, it's not just, uh, you know, the storyteller, but it's really those who are listening how they come along, how they enact, how they, how they, how they feel they're part of, uh, you know, the story as it's unfolding. Uh, and I suppose that's, to go back to your for, former question, that's what I really miss, right? Being on the road, interacting, how stories uh, unfolded, how, how I saw people that I saw. I see him as a very quiet storyteller. He always serviced the story in a, in a way that didn't draw attention to himself, but he was in full command of his craft. Whereas your empress was anything but quiet. This is a compelling story. So before we get into Noor Jahan and who she was, Ruby, I want you to set the stage. Tell us what was the Mughal Empire? Who ruled in the 16th century? And what was the role of women in that context? Mm -hmm. I think that's a that's a great start. That's the that's the scenery. That's the context. That's the um, that's the preface. But I want to begin from the beginnings, if you will. I want to begin from um, you know the man who's called the founder of the Mughal rule, the first emperor Babur, who was actually the fifth generation descendant of two great Central Asian heroes who we know here in the West, Timur or Tamerlane and Genghis Khan, the ferocious. Central Asian warrior. Um, and I mention this because Mughal dynasty or the great empire or the empire of lore and memory and of, of the Kohinoor and of the great pearls and of great diamonds, uh, this was not the way it began. Uh, this was essentially really a dynasty, but of course this is a dynasty with great, uh, you know, two illustrious lines flowing in their blood, if you will. But they were really nomadic. They moved from Central Asia through Afghanistan. Uh, and then eventually in 1526, after a series of forays, the first emperor uh, begins the settlement uh, uh, in India, uh, which was not called India then. Uh, it was, you know, when people moved from Afghanistan into the, uh, uh, into the territory of the Indian subcontinent or the Northern territory of the Indian subcontinent, they called it Al-Hind, which means uh, across the river Indus. So, so this is the mind we are talking about. It's a, it's a time of, so this is another word that's, that's you know, talked about, uh, discussed fervently at the moment, migration. Uh, the time of the early Mughals as they move from, from land to land is really a time of migratory ethics, uh, which, is, which is not, to it, is not always attached this sense of emergency and, and stringency that has come to be attached to the idea of migration with modern nation states. Uh, so, so it's a time in which, uh, you know, many people, many dynasties, so it's royal dynasties, but it's also really calligraphers, it's mystics, it's, it's wanderers, it's travelers, it's bandits, all sorts of people are moving. Um, it's a very moving, roving, uh, world that we are that we are talking about. What the is time the, 
what is the impetus for that movement, Ruby? And what role do women play? Do they have agency or are they just going along for the ride? So the, the impetus is one is really, of course, expansion of land, expansion of territory, more and more territorial acquisition. That's how much of the early modern empires were built. That's really how they, how they functioned. Uh, the women in the nomadic steppe tradition, uh, so to speak, of this early Mughals were extremely dynamic women. They were not veiled. Uh, they were not behind. There was no harem walls. Uh, the, this was essentially a tented society. And, you know, we are not talking about picnic tents. We are talking about, you know, thousands and thousands of people uh, pitching their tents. But of course, there's, there's, there's great dynamic to that tent building. Uh, you know, where the emperor is going to stay, where the women are going to stay, where the elderly women are going to stay, where uh, the servants and the attendants or the eunuchs, how the boundaries are going to be defined. Uh, and actually, those tented communities become the model for the early palaces uh, in India. So these are these are extremely dynamic women. These are women who uh, who will counsel the kings. They'll they'll advise. They're adept in poetry, horse riding, polo, uh, uh, embroidery, um, and out of these, uh, you know, early generations of women, uh, way before Nur Jahan, the Empress, uh, we are going to have the first woman chronicler. Uh, of the dynasty of the great Mughals, to who I have now turned. <laughs> so although women were not veiled, there were harms. They were not walled in, in these, in these mobile tented cities, which were really very elegant predecessors to palaces, as you say. Um, describe what harm life was. We in the West have very limited ideas about what we think of it as a pleasure palace for one emperor to enjoy at will. How so, correct or, or way off base is that perception? So first of all, um, Haram as a uh, you know wide establishment that is a huge uh, stone or uh, red sandstone, as in the case of the first Mughal Harams in India, which were built in Fatehpur Sikri, uh, just outside Agra, which is now the home of the Taj Mahal. We didn't have the Taj Mahal at that time. Uh, that palatial structure, I want to, I want to emphasize, actually did not come into being and was not constructed up until the time of the Empress's father-in-law, uh, which is really, uh, you know, the late 1580s. Uh, uh, to, to, to be very precise, 1572 begins uh, the launch of those red sandstone cities and palaces and so on. So you have these very extensive quarters. Um, uh, you know, which are which are which are marked, uh, and again, as I said, the tent is the idea. Tent is replicated onto the city, but more about the denizens of of the of the uh, of the of the harem. The first time that Akbar the Great, Nur Jahan, or the Empress's father-in-law, the first time that he builds uh, the harem in Fatehpur Sikri, the idea was really quite staggering. The idea was that. Architecturally, he was using this as a statecraft, right? He was saying that, look, we are here to stay. Look at these grand, formidable, amazing palaces. Uh, but there was something else that went with his philosophy. He also, for the first time in the history of his empire, he segregated his own women. He called them the veiled ones. Uh, but uh, given the incredible um, uh, agency, given the incredible uh, playfulness and creativity of women, they were not going to be domesticated behind walls. And, what um, was and well, who were these women age-wise? Were they marriageable women? Were they virgins? Were they mothers? Were they widows? Who were they? Well, you know, uh, so this is a, this is a, uh, for want of a better word, but to use the modern terminology, uh, and of course, Haram captures this. This is a multi-generational household. You have the empress's great aunts, you have his aunts, you have his you know, wives, you have uh, wet nurses, you have uh, foster brothers, you have foster sisters, you have children, and you have you know, the, the extensive staff that you can almost uh, uh, imagine uh, that would live with them. Uh, the extraordinary thing about, uh, just to go back to Akbar's harem, the extraordinary thing is that uh, the idea of the harem, even in terms of numbers, was meant to dignify the emperor, right? So his own court historian says at one point uh, that his majesty had somewhere along 
3,000 or so women. And we had these Jesuit fathers that visited uh, the, um, uh, the um, you know, the court of Akbar, and they were completely intrigued. One of them commented, a man called Father Montserrat, he wrote this extraordinary little piece uh, of history in which he wrote, this emperor has 300 wives, and he doesn't even have more than four children. So this, this, this idea of having that many wives, uh, let's say between 300 and 3,000, actually a lot of these were political marriages. Uh, not every marriage was meant to be uh, meant to be uh, you know consummated, uh, and so there were hierarchies of women. There were very clearly defined uh, rights of women within these. Uh, but also, I mean, I don't want to overly romanticize this. Yes, uh, there's a great deal of dynamism. I think there's huge amount of community building here, uh, but there is also um, the will of the emperor. The emperor is the center of of the world, right? The emperor is the center of all commands. The emperor is uh, is going to will and desire and uh, and and everything. Uh, and yet, the women were not uh, entirely uh, subsumed and submerged uh, in this ocean of women. Right? They were able to do a whole range of uh, quite extraordinary things, uh, such as, as I mentioned, counseling, such as. Uh, writing, such as poetry, such as other things, uh, until Noor Jahan, who actually really, you know, breaks um, all sorts of boundaries. And she was not even from the family. I want to be very, very clear. She was not from the Mughal family. Uh, she was the 20th wife of the fourth Mughal emperor, that is the son of Akbar the Great, who we've, we've, we've just been talking about. She's not only the 20th wife, but she becomes his wife after uh, Jang um, Jahangir's wife, after having joined his harem, after she was widowed. Ostensibly, she was widowed because her husband was impl implicated in a plot against Jahangir and then killed. So yes. wasn't it problematic to have the widow of a woman who you are responsible for widowing in your harem or no? Um so uh, uh yes and no. <laughs> let me respond to that question first of all i think the point you're making is a, is a very critical point which is that she had been there was a very long marriage a marriage of 12 years which has been noted in history in practically one uh, line which is that she was married to uh, ali kuli and that she lives in bengal and now i just want to take our um, our listeners and and viewers uh, to the idea of Bengal at this time. This is like Wild West, one of the earliest territories that, is, that has been brought under the control uh, of the Mughals. And there she goes to an entirely different geography, age 17, married to this man who is, uh, you know, from everything we can tell of Noor Jahan and her upbringing, uh, you know, she's cerebral, she's poetic, she's aesthetically inclined. Uh, and she gets married to this very brave, very dynamic man, but he's a man of action. Essentially, he's a he's a he's a very important uh, official, and he too, uh, you know, came from from Iran, like Noor Jahan's uh, parents. So that may have been the affinity that her father felt in 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 marrying her, uh, marrying her off. But Bengal uh, that I charted in this book out of really there was virtually nothing on her marriage, but and I mean in terms of evidence and in terms of sources. But really, it was completely possible to imagine what were the center and state relationships? What was the landscape like? How was it different? Uh, you know, she recites poetry. She, she writes poetry uh, that is so much about multiple forms of divine love. Uh, where did this idea come from? Of course, the idea comes from her own mystically inclined family. But the idea also comes from uh, a direct communication uh, with God that was taking place in Bengal in 16th century. Um, there was a very famous uh, mystic, a man called, uh, his name was, uh, uh, you know, Baka, and he was much loved by the Mughal emperors. So those are the kinds of people, uh, you know, she visits, she builds. How did she become a great, uh, uh, you know, hunter of tigers? Bengal, the land of the Bengal tiger. And the okay, arrangements have, of her husband. Excuse me, Ruby. Er, if you can pull up the portrait of, yes, Nur Jahan holding a musket, and Ruby, you tell us why that that photograph or that portrait is so singular. Yeah. 
Yes, that portrait is very singular. And I'll just uh, come to this, but just very quickly, uh, you know, finish by saying um, that this is really where she'll have, uh, you know, mastered the art of hunting, which, of course, uh, aristocratic women, uh, you know, learned. So to jump back to her, um, her post marriage years with Jahangir from 1611, this is a portrait that is held in Rampur Raza Library in Northern India. This is extremely well known to art historians. It had been pr produced, but kind of lost in major art historical uh, Mughal catalogs. Um, and this painting was made uh, by the uh, painter laureate uh, of Jahangir's court, a man called Abul Hassan, who was who is uh, recognized as one of the finest portraiture uh, makers, not only of that time, but pretty much from that entire, uh, uh, you know, atelier. Uh, and by that, I mean the Mughal atelier. But in fact, this man really broke from tradition uh, in order to make this uh, painting. What was this painter's inheritance? His, in his in inheritance was really essentially bejeweled, uh, uh, you know, Mughal women, all of who looked alike in paintings. This is the kind of painting that was being uh, produced. You know, they almost always looked similar, except that their dresses or their signs would give way to who they were. And this had to do with the fact that women were not accessible. And Mughal painting begins once more uh, in the court of Noor Jahan's father-in-law, who we've been talking about. This is all part of the making of the city, the first atelier, the first harem, all of these kinds of things. So this painting art historians have established was drawn somewhere between or painted somewhere between 1612 and 17. 1611 is the year that Noor Jahan marries the emperor. If this is drawn in 1612, it's pretty staggering. If it, if it is drawn, as art historians have argued, even, even later on, let's say 1617 or 18, even then it's pretty formidable. And let me tell you why. One, she marries the emperor in 1611 and her ascent is pretty swift, uh, but really the first uh, coins in her name uh, and this is a technical sign of, of sovereignty in uh, the Islamic world, but also really uh, in the world of Noor and Jahangir. Uh, you know, the coins are inscribed with their name, but that happens much, much later on. Uh, and in a little while, I'm going to ask Iyar to pull up some other images. She comes out onto the imperial balconies to give viewing to, the, to, to those that had gathered below her. Uh, and this was a practice her father-in-law had taken from the Indic traditions, uh, that is coming onto the balcony, almost viewing uh, or being viewed uh, like a god or goddess. So this is the kind of evidence the painter is dealing with here. And this is what he produces. He produces Noor Jahan with a gun. She's dressed exactly like uh, uh, any nobleman of the time. There's, uh, you know, the head wrap. Uh, what gives way and how we understand that this is a woman is that the 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 jama that she's wearing the top dress that she's wearing a it's transparent and b that it narrows around the waist um, we we won't be able to expand the image but the clocks that she's wearing just behind the clocks at the back of her feet it's laden with henna uh, and likewise the slight rise uh, in the left of her chest is really pretty staggering uh, very critically, uh, she's loading the musket, uh, and that, uh, you know, suggests know-how. Uh, so all this is to suggest, going back to another very important point about hunting, when I began research on this, on this book, um, and as I, as, as I was reading the various sources, including her husband's memoir, the only thing that I kept on reading about was that he made this nonstop mention of her hunting again and again and again. And I thought to myself, you know, what is this about hunting? And if I spoke to other scholars, they'll say, well, you know, in the memoirs, there isn't that much on Noor Jahan. And I thought to myself, well, we are missing some clue. If he's talking about hunting nonstop, he's clearly talking in a, a stream of consciousness style, right? He's not saying, hey, you Mughal historians, 400 years later, hunting means this. And I figured out, uh, thanks to the lead of those who've written on war and hunting and other kinds of methods and equipment, that 
hunting was another informal sign of sovereignty that not everybody, particularly not all, could hunt tigers. And so the book begins with this uh, whole uh, scene of Noor Jahan saving her subjects from a uh, killer tiger. Will you share that scene with us, Ruby? Yes, I'd be, I'd be very happy to um, read that. I think that scene will also allow those who haven't read um, it's a slightly long scene, but it'll it'll tell you something about Noor Jahan, but also really um, uh, how was she uh, how was she being the empress or co-sovereign as I have uh, launched her. And I could also mention before you start your reading that movies have made about Noor Jahan. Other biographies have been written, although I would argue that yours is probably the definitive biography. And there was even an opera made about her. So she is really a mythic, not only a legendary character, but a mythic character in India. Yes, indeed. Okay. Um, so, so I'll begin with the autumn of 1619. What page are you on for people like me who have their books and want to read along with you? Page one. <laughs> <laughs> this is the beginning of the book. And now you know why I began with the scene. Okay. In the autumn of 1619, when the days were clear and cool, perfect for travel, the royal cavalcade of Emperor Jahangir and Empress Noor Jahan, his 20th and favorite wife, set out from Agra, the capital of Mughal India, headed for the Himalayan foothills. The people of Matra, a popular pilgrimage site along the emperor's route, were anxious for his arrival. For months, a tiger had been attacking villagers and visitors, then disappearing into the forest, evading local hunters. No divine intervention seemed to be forthcoming from Lord Krishna and his consort Radha, the Hindu deities worshipped in Mathura's temples. But the emperor could solve the problem. Killing tigers had long been a royal prerogative. Jahangir, his name meant conqueror of the world in Persian, the language of the court, was the fourth of the Mughal emperors, a Muslim dynasty established by invasion early in the 16th century. So return to that moment. According to one excited observer, the imperial procession included 1,500,000 people. These are the tented lifestyles we are talking about. Men, women, and children, courtiers, soldiers, and servants, along with 10,000 elephants and great deal of artillery. The procession halted near Mathura and the attendants began erecting hundreds of magnificent tents with the haram quarters marked with intricately carved red screens. While the traveling court was still being set up, a group of local huntsmen appeared and begged Jahangir to do something about the tiger. Unfortunately, the emperor was obliged to decline. Several years before, he had taken a vow to give up hunting when he turned 50. After that, he had promised Allah he would injure no living beings with his own hands. He was two months past that milestone birthday and had recently renewed the vow as an offering on behalf of a favorite four-year-old grandson traveling with them who suffered from epilepsy. Shooting a tiger was now out of the question of for Jahangir. The empress, however, was there to protect her subjects. Beautiful and accomplished, Noor Jahan was the daughter of nobles who had fled persecution in Persia. She was also the widow of a court official implicated in a plot against Jahangir, but that didn't stop the emperor from falling hard for her. She was 34 when they married, nearly middle-aged in the Mughal world. Since their wedding in 1611, the same year that Shakespeare premiered The Tempest, Noor Jahan, light of the world in Persian, the same, the name bestowed by her husband, had proved to be a devoted wife, a wise and just queen, a shrewd politician, and an expert markswoman. Her shooting skills were already legendary. A few years earlier, she had amazed her husband and his courtiers by slaying four tigers with only six shots. So Noor Jahan mounted an elephant and settled into her howdah, the elaborate litter on the animal's back, holding a musket. The mahout, the elephant handler, led her along the sandy track towards the forest. Noor Jahan accompanied her husband Jahangir on his own elephant, and they were followed by a long line of courtiers, some on superbly ornamented elephants and horses, and others in red and gold jeweled palanquins with silken seats, decorated with garlands of flowers and carried by attendants. 
portraits of Noor Jahan, one that you just saw, uh, suggest that she was wearing a regal turban, much like the ones favored by the emperor and distinguished nobleman, but highly unusual for a woman. Knee length tunic with a sash around the waist, over tight trousers, and earrings and necklace of rubies, diamonds, or pearls. Her shoes were open at the back, exposing the henna designs on her feet. At 42, she was still praised by her contemporaries for her luminous beauty. Local hunters on foot gathered the party past fields of barley, peas, and cotton, lush from the recent rains. Along the way, they spotted herds of cattle, goats, and black buck with long corkscrew horns. When they reached the forest, the emperor and empress could barely see beyond the dense wall of creepers, bushes, and trees, lofty neem, thorny baboon, and many others. The hunters showed the empress and her retinue the spot where the tiger was likely to appear and they waited. Soon, Noor's elephant, in the lead, began groaning and stepping nervously from side to side. The Mahout couldn't make it stand still, and Noor Jahan's howdah lurched precariously. From his own elephant, Jahangir looked on, silent and focused. Later, he would recall the moment in the Jahangir Nama, the memoirs of Jahangir, a journal he began when he ascended the throne in 1605, and that would serve as the public record of his reign. An elephant is not at ease when it smells a tiger and is continually in movement, he wrote. And to hit with a gun from a litter is a very hard matter. The tiger emerged from the trees. Noor lifted her musket, aimed between the animal's eyes, and pulled the trigger. Despite the swaying of her elephant, one shot was enough. The tiger fell to the ground, killed instantly. Jahangir was delighted and he scattered, I'll just add, hundreds of coins at her. I'll stop at that. Okay. So apart from being a master shot, Nur Jahan has also distinguished herself as a dress designer, an architect, a designer of gardens, and a poet. Did this make her unusual in the harem, Ruby? And I'm, I'm still wondering how a woman who was widowed, who entered the harem at 31, is the 20th wife of the emperor, and she has a child from her previous marriage, how she rose so fast. Was she unusual for her time? Yes, I think uh, it's a question I've been asked many, many times. Uh, and the form in which I've been asked this question um, uh, has also been how did she do it back then uh, and in India? Uh, and the quick answer is really uh, that, you know, our understanding of the times past as somehow retrogressive, and as we go into modernity, somehow that they are progressive, uh, I think is, 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 it, it can easily be challenged. And it's one as a uh, historian of early modern India, uh, I've constantly challenged in my own writing, in my thinking, and certainly in my in my in my teaching. Uh, and uh, so, you know, while people didn't have the language of rights that we, thank God, we we have it today, uh, I think there were there were other forms in which uh, uh, people negotiated, uh, you know, realities. Uh, they they negotiated uh, the circumstances, the the the, the environments. Uh, and the other thing, uh, you know, that also uh, I often think uh, one of the things I've been uh, I, I thought very hard and I worked really very hard was to really begin to understand as I went along in my research uh, what what became clear to me was also that uh, you know her circumstances were right she had uh, you know uh, absolutely extraordinary parents very liberal mystically inclined it was a poetic household. Uh, by the by, the time she marries the emperor, her father is the prime minister of the empire. Each and every member of uh, her household, uh, uh, that is, uh, you know, the the three brothers, uh, cousins, and and members of other families. Uh, so they come from aristocratic families and then get employed in India. So they they are in really high uh, positions. Her own mother, uh, you know, Asma Begum, is a very very dynamic. Uh, uh, woman, very playful, extremely vivacious. So this is the upbringing. And then we spoke about Bengal, right? Uh, I almost imagine herself as this, you know, a plant that goes and comes back as this, you know, huge dynamic tree that is now going to give, uh, you know, shade to everybody. 
And then she comes into the harem and quite clearly, I don't want to undo the love of the emperor and the empress. She clearly had him uh, on her side. So there's this, you know, circle around her. Um, and it seems to me, I mean, her husband Jahangir has also been one of the things I've attempted to do, although I've had to hold him back in the book because it's, you know, I, and I'd love to speak about what that means in terms of actual evidence and, uh, you know, what it means in terms of the practices of a historian, but that later. Uh, he's a very interesting character. He's been written, uh, uh, he's been written into histories and yet written, erased practically while being written into histories as this kind of drunk. Uh, and therefore, that's the reason why she became possible. Well, he never left the throne, right? He participated fully. He was a moody, philosophical, highly dynamic man. So this is a this is the, these are her circumstances. But last but not least, it really is also Nur Jahan. So you mentioned, you know, how does it begin? That's that's the charting. That's the character development as empress, if you will that I've done in the book. And it begins with incredible solidarities in the harem, the three uh, senior most uh, women, the emperor's mother and two stepmothers really take her under, under her wings. Um, and, you know, she begins slowly to understand the language of gift giving, which is so important. She begins to understand the language of ceremony. Um, she begins to design clothing for um, very, very poor denizens, women denizens of the harem, uh, so that when they got married, they could, they, could, they could wear these dresses. These dresses are actually still sold in the bazaars of, of Agra. They are called Noor Maheli, because when she comes to the harem and marries the emperor, she's first called Noor Mahel, or light of the palace. And again, uh, light, there are, there are, there, there's a lot to be said about why uh, you know, light is so attached to her various names that she that she gets uh, and then eventually it's very interesting there is not a single thing that she does in which whether it is her trend setting buildings uh, or the imperial order she has the highest imperial orders uh, that she they're called nishans which is another technical symbol of exercising sovereignty so it has her stamp it has she's very innovative in the stamp she calls it Noor Jahan Patsha Begum, Noor Jahan, her name. Patsha meaning king. Uh, Begum is an honorific. So it's quite extraordinary ways in which she's working out the languages of, uh, uh, you know, these things. I mean, her father's mausoleum uh, right across the river from the Taj. But uh, ER, if you could pull up, pull up the mausoleum, I'd like to show the mausoleum to uh, the image of the a mausoleum. It's like a jewel box. It's a small which like jewel Nur Jahan box. designed. I'm sorry. Which Nur Jahan designed? Which she designed, and it's uh, you know, it's a um, uh, it, it's the first time because all the buildings by this time. This is an 18th century photograph uh, of the jewel box, but you can see. Uh, so I'll retrace steps. Um, That's a big jewel know, box, Ruby. It's a jewel box. All the Mughal buildings by this time, up, up until this time, except for slight usages, were mainly constructed in red sandstone. And this is the first time she actually builds uh, or uh, designs this building, which is the mausoleum of her parents in marble. Uh, and if you look at the Taj Mahal, Taj Mahal uh, takes its inspiration, which is built by her stepson, uh, you know, several, several years later. Uh, takes the design and the composition. It's essentially this composition, much more uh, expansive, much more. Um, I love this much more than the Taj Mahal. I find Taj Mahal so much more intimidating, and this is, uh, you know, so much more uh, uh, intimate. Uh, just on legends, the uh, tour guides that I spoke with in in Agra, they call this the Baby Taj because it's small which I think as an historian, this is anachronistic. I think that is the baby Taj. <laughs> this was the real Taj. This was so, first. So, yeah. For all of her power and her ability to stay on top, she, by the time her husband dies, she has a stepson who hates her and who has imprisoned his father. So she had to come overcome a lot of palace intrigue. Was she yeah. incorruptible or could she get as down and dirty as the dirtiest politician to maintain her power? 
Did she ever disappoint you? Or did you ever say, oh no, not you too, Nora? <laughs> I love that question. No, she never disappointed me. Now, now here is why. While I said that the harem was this amazing place that she, you know, really rose to power despite, uh, uh, you know, um, rich times, a rich landscape, rich people around her. Nonetheless, uh, this was a man's world, right? It's a feudal patriarchal world. Uh, and so what I was staggered by was in all, all the documentation that I saw, I mean, really rich documentation, people were puzzled, but they never denigrated her, right? Uh, I mean, they were intrigued and they, uh, you know, they, they just let her be. So the coins were okay, the, the orders were all right. Even her coming into the imperial balconies was okay, shooting the tiger, you know, wow, all of that. But in 1626, a year before Jahangir dies, he's captured by or put into captivity. Uh, you know, the story is very, very long. I won't go into it. But plus, I want you to buy the book and read it, okay? So... Uh, she's he's taken into into captivity and she strategizes she fails initially uh, but she 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 really strategizes brilliantly again and she's able to rescue the emperor and one of the moments uh, in that rescuing is that she gets upon an elephant and heads a battle now heading a battle uh, I've called that chapter fitna uh, I call it fitna because literally from about that time, this term begins to emerge in the documentation. To give you a simple translation, this is the beginning of the nasty woman, okay? But essentially, fitna has a very long history in Islamic history. Um, it's, its beginnings go to the time uh, when uh, it's, it's used for various things. The, 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 the first is the civil strife when Shias and Sunnis uh, you know, go into two, 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 uh, two parties, if you will. But it is also attributed to Prophet Muhammad's beloved Aisha when she gets upon, uh, uh, it's called the Battle of Camels, and she goes out to fight uh, after the uh, uh, death of uh, Prophet Muhammad in order to, uh, you know, think about succession and to fight Ali. And so fitna is used against her. But over time, fitna came to be used uh, for women's sexuality, but essentially to say that women created chaos, right? Uh, and that they were destructive. So this was really, uh, you know, the beginning of uh, the loss. How she, uh, and she loses it. She loses the battle. Uh, her stepson succeeds after her husband's death. Now, two things really staggered me, um, even after this. And that's why I said she didn't disappoint me, which is, that typically a lot of the elderly women, the what they were, you know, the the, the so-called haraman or the beneficent seniors, uh, when they became senior or elderly, you know, they would often go to the to the haram where they would be welcomed and, um, you know, um, they would be respected as advisors and counselors, as I've been saying, um, and also the haram of her stepson. Her stepson is actually married to her niece. Uh, and uh, her niece is the daughter of uh, her brother. So it's a very close-knit relationship, which means she could have gone, and she doesn't. Um, now, of course, we have to remember that she is a woman of wealth, right? Uh, there's, a, there's a biographical dictionary that I consulted that had six, 368 uh, uh, you know, huge biographies of Mughal nobles. Amongst them, there was one woman, Nur Jahan. And the title this biographer gives her is called Nawab, which means... Uh, the aristocrat, right? So she had landed holdings. She had huge amount of, uh, you know, money. And this was also the reason I keep saying this uh, in my biography. And this is, you know, the way in which I've also been thinking about the genre of biography. I actually refuse to kill Noor Jahan because, you know, we, we, uh, we have practically no other way to reconstruct. She survives the emperor by another 18 years. Uh, and a lot of the designs that she had built on the on the on the various buildings, they are replicated. She'll have seen from afar when the Taj is being built. Uh, she would counsel. She continues to, you know, she also designs the mausoleum of her husband uh, in Lahore, which is where she was based, 
uh, now in Pakistan. So all of these things are, are, are going on. I mean, for all intent and purposes, she was practically killed out of Indian history. So that exactly. was a kind of, um, uh, you know, political um, commitment not to kill her. And therefore, the last chapter is called Beyond 1627. Let's talk about contemporary Indian politics and the rise of Hindu nationalism, which you say threatens to erase Noor Jahan's legacy. Why would politicians today have a vested interest in erasing the empress's his legacy and her history? Well, um, uh, I think uh, uh, we know that uh, India is at the moment um, under the leadership of uh, extreme Hindu right wing regime, the BJP. Um, and uh, in initially in subtle and then not so subtle ways, one of the populations that uh, that they've attacked in a variety of ways uh, are Muslims in India. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is the long standing history of being and belonging of Muslims in India. I mean, the Mughals and this there's really just much more. Uh, and the way in which uh, it has got translated, the rank has got translated. There are many ways, but one of the ways that has disturbed me uh, eternally and for a really long time uh, is that uh, in many states, starting with, uh, you know, Rajasthan and Maharashtra and several other places, uh, Mughals have been practically wiped out from history textbooks. Uh, and by, by that, I mean, initially, you know, uh, when I was a, a girl uh, studying in schools in India, we had lots of chapters on the Mughals, right? We had Akbar, uh, Noor Jahan's father-in-law, for instance, uh, was celebrated as this, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of a figure that, and he did. He experimented with various kinds of religions, uh, which is, uh, this is a different uh, stream of thought, but he's been classified as a, as, a, as a secularist and so on, and hence a great hero. Now, uh, the way in which uh, history textbooks have been recast in India is, for example, in grade eight textbook, uh, in Maharashtra, there is only a paragraph on Akbar, and he is not a hero anymore. He is, quote unquote, an invader, right? Akbar so being it is the father of Jahangir. Akbar being the father of Jahangir. So this is just simply to give you one example. If this is the scenario, then how do you expect incredible, uh, uh, you know, figures such as Noor Jahan to emerge into textbooks? And I, I give you the example of textbooks simply because. Um, you know, uh, uh, I think kids going to school, this kind of imprinting that takes place uh, in your minds, the stories you hear, this is really about, you know, what you're hearing. And, uh, you know, again, I have uh, in the introduction to my book, uh, my mother, who's a, who's a practicing Hindu woman, telling me the story of Noor Jahan. You know, this is her legacy. This is my legacy. Right. This is the plural ethics I'm talking about. And once you create these antagonisms, invader and local, you know, this is real India. That is not real India. This is who belongs. This is who does not belong. Right. It completely takes away, uh, uh, you know, the plural ethics in which I grew up, the plural, plural ethics of Al-Hind that possibly made no Jahan. Right. That's what I'm talking about. Um, and, you know, so the memory of the Mughals has really reduced to uh, Mughlai food, uh, to some symbols to which people, even Taj Mahal, what is the relationship of people? Um, it's, 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 a, it's a consumerist relationship. Right. It's yeah. the relationship of the, of the street, of the home, of the mother, in which you share things, in which it is yours as much as it's mine. You know, that's what I'm talking about. You I think that's what the is doing. You call it the history of India. So did your understanding of India, India's history, India's present, India's people evolve as a result of researching and writing this biography, Ruby? Um, you know, I think uh, I've written academic histories before. And um, when I, uh, so the story of Noor Jahan, uh, you know, I have to just uh, uh, simply tell you another story in order to, to, to give you this answer, which is really, um, I heard first about Noor Jahan when I was a little girl growing up, you know, in Dehradun in North India and my mother. Yeah, let's see that picture of Ruby as a little girl. 
<laughs> and I have to say happy belated birthday to your mother who celebrated her birthday yesterday. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, you're telling the story and then ER will find that photograph for us. For your so audience. my mother, I grew up with her. You know, she's a, she's a, she's a wonderful storyteller. She told us all sorts of um, uh, stories on hot summer afternoons when we got really mischievous or <laughs> that looks like a mischievous, mischievous little Ruby. <laughs> About that time, I think <laughs> maybe a little younger. Um, and so, you know, she used to tell the stories all the time. And I remember being really besotted by her stories, but I was very impatient that one afternoon. And I asked her to tell me a story and I wanted her to tell me a new story. And for the first time, she told me the story of Nur Jahan. And this is critical. She called her Maharani, which means queen of queens, right? And so Noor Jahan never left me one way or another. In time, uh, you know, I became um, uh, an historian of Mughal India and, uh, you know, began to look at that history, which really did not have a strong feminist side to really thinking what you asked me to begin with, Gail, what was the world of women, you know, why did we not have any history of the haram? Why was this? We knew it and yet we didn't know it. And that was my you know, first book. And then I wrote another book on the Indian girl child. Um, and as I was finishing that book um, uh, and, you know, uh, an editor from India wrote to me saying uh, just one line. Uh, and she, she headed Peng Penguin India at that time. She said, um, would you write uh, a biography of Noor Jahan for us. Now, my first book, which is on the Mughal women, her predecessors, really stopped just before Noor Jahan. And when I saw that email, I literally started kicking in my back because I thought this should have been my idea. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I walked into, into, into office and I, uh, you know, I was talking to a colleague of mine and she said to me, Ruby, you know, uh, she's from Morocco. She said, uh, in Morocco, we believe it's not the authors who choose their subjects, it's the subjects who choose their authors. Um, and really, that's when I decided that, you know, this was my mother's story, my colleague saying this to me, that invitation, these are accretions, right? And I felt that I had to write this book uh, very, very differently, that I had to, um, that I had to take her to the world stage, essentially. That was my desire, because the more I thought, the, the more I realized the crux of the matter is this, to go back to politics, to go back to history, to go back to storytelling. That we, when we think of the great Mughals of India, we think of the male Mughals of India. Well, there was one woman amongst them, Noor Jahan, and I wanted to launch her. Um, and I think the craft of uh, writing in the form in which I was initiated into her world by my mother uh, is the craft I wanted to think further. And I think biography allowed me to do that. Of course, um, I have many, many uh, acknowledgements to many, many friends, colleagues, my editors, um, uh, you know, uh, for, for being there in this journey. I want ER to pull up a photograph of your mother now while I ask you, <laughs> for her response. She was your first storyteller, and now you have given her this beautiful biography of Noor Jahan. How did your mother respond to your book? Well, um, yeah, I think she was in tears, you know, and I have a, um, I actually- um, Your mother looks like an empress, by the way, Ruby. She's well, very beautiful, is, yes. You know, Gail just asked me for a photo of my mother about the time she may have told me the story. This is at her graduation. And, you know, this is this is looking a bit foggy here. Uh, but this is the best we could pull out. Uh, so we just have a because she told me the story in Hindi. And there are two translations of the book that are coming out in India, one in Hindi uh, and uh, one in Tamil that I don't read or understand. I've dedicated the Hindi book to her and she knows that. And she's very proud. Well, happy Mother's Day, Mama Ruby, or I should call her Didi, I suppose, Auntie. <laughs> and then we have time for questions now. So ER, I guess you'll pull up questions you have been sourcing for us. Yes, so um, the first question is, um, says thank you for your well, wonderful introduction to your book, Ruby. I'm wondering if you came upon the Persian couplet co-composed by 
Jahangir and Nur Jahan, it captures her poetic wit. Yes, I have actually. And uh, may I just read that out to you? Um, that would be great. This is a to her. I, I don't have this one in the book, um, uh, but this was reproduced um, in, uh, you know, late, sort of middle to late 17th century uh, in Bengal, actually. The, the new moon of the Eid, that is Eid al-Fitr, is in full view in the sky, Jahangir says. The key to the tavern had been lost, but is now found. No Jahan response. So um, I think you're, you're, you're mentioning this one. There's another one in which uh, first line by Jahangir, pearly tears are rolling down from your eyes. And here is what she says. The water I have drunk without you comes forth from my eyes. So these are the these are the two. two um, there's another one she teasingly uh, says to him that I think Gail wanted me to read, so I might as well just uh, read it. Um, uh, I actually don't think this is the one she wanted me to read, but page one eleven, um, the poem about roses. Uh, yes. Uh, what page is that on, Gail? Please remind one, me. One uh, uh, one eleven at the bottom of the page, Ruby. Or maybe it's, hang on a second. Yeah, 111, bottom of the page. Okay. Yes. Um, so her mother, um, uh, this is written by Jahangir. Her mother once uh, just gathers together huge numbers of roses and the foam and the perfume of the rose uh, accumulates on top. And uh, this is in front of her daughter and her husband, the emperor. Uh, and she she makes this rose perfume, uh, and there's a poem that may have been we don't know the exact dating of these poems, but uh, Noor may have composed it about that time. And this is how it goes: If the rosebud is opened by the breeze in the garden, the key to our heart's lock is in the beloved smile. The heart of one held captive by beauty and coquetry knows neither roses nor color nor aroma nor face nor tresses. Um, and I'll just read one last one because I think it's really quite critical to our, uh, to our times. Uh, and this is really uh, uh, the great Hafiz, uh, the philosopher poet, had also written something to this effect. It's called 72 Creeds. Essentially, it means there's just there's so much uh, factionalism and fighting. And why does this take place? And so here's a poem that she writes called 72 Creeds. I do not lose my heart to the appearance if the character is not known. I believe in love, so all the other faiths are known. O oh, ascetic, do not cast fear of the doomsday in our hearts. We've experienced the horror of separation, so doomsday is known. Ruby, I know that ER, there are beautiful color plates in your book. While ER is looking for questions, if she is, would you like to take us through and give us a tour of some of the photographs we can find in Empress? Yes, yes, certainly. So, so um, uh, you already saw the um, uh, you know Empress with the with the musket that was painted by Abul Hassan. Uh, we can show uh, the signs with Noor and Jahangir's names. Uh, there are 10 of these remain. They are in Lucknow, uh, a couple in Berlin, uh, and uh, some museums in India. So, ER, if you could pull up the coins, that would be really great. Yes. The silver rupee? The, that one? Oops, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, the silver rupee. Yes, that's right. Okay. And so, as I said, the coins are also um, a technical uh, symbol of authority. If we are able to pull up, otherwise I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. There we go. There we go. So, so there you are. Those are the coins. Uh, and then the next one, uh, again, this is uh, pretty formidable. This is portrait to be worn as a jewel, uh, if we can bring that up. Um, uh, yes, that's it. 
So this is uh, this is actually a very interesting uh, a painting. This is um, held in Harvard Museum. Um, and one of the technicalities um, art historians suggest, so this is the Jaroka, that is the imperial uh, balcony, uh, or there, there were several imperial balconies uh, that, uh, you know, from where the emperor or empress could show uh, herself or himself uh, to the masses that gathered uh, below. This is, this is like coming out uh, and the masses from below view you as god or goddesses. Um, uh, so uh, this is established as Noor Jahan. And why this is a jharokha, that is the viewing or the darshan image, uh, there's only one technical art historical clue in this. Uh, if you can see the little hand touching on the balcony, almost every image uh, from the Mughal world uh, that's built with uh, this balcony projection uh, of a prince or an emperor and so on uh, has this uh, little hand uh, suggesting there. Then we also saw the um, image of Itmad um, uh, the mausoleum of her parents, that is. And then we have two more images uh, that are rather contemporary and they're very interesting. I'd like us to see those uh, down below. Mughal Queen Nojahan playing polo. Um, actually, not that one, but the next one. Uh, uh, Killing Tiger, this one. Uh, no, the next one, please. So this is a this is a very interesting um, uh, recasting of that scene that I read out to you, and I say that this is interesting also because uh, there's a recovery here of Noor Jahan by a man called Ustad Muhammad Sharif, who was in Pakistan, and he actually renewed and recast the Mughal school of painting in the nineteen. Uh, 50s onwards, and one of the earliest paintings. So he uh, was a painter who practiced Mughal painting and belonged to the Patiala court uh, in India, uh, and then taught uh, uh, in Lahore. And he trained some early modern practitioners of Mughal art. Um, and so this art is called Mughal miniature. I mean, what we are seeing on the screen is very large. These are really, uh, most of these miniatures are as large as if that uh, our hands, the size of our hands. That's what we are talking about. The interesting thing is that Haji Muhammad Sharif actually begins his entire oeuvre by casting images of Noor Jahan, either killing a tiger or holding a pigeon, all sovereign um, illusions. Uh, and I had read about these images, but I uh, searched high and low, and by the time the book was already going in press, finally I made a connection with his grandson uh, in Pakistan, who very kindly gave me the permission to reproduce these two paintings. So I really just um, wanted to share this phenomenal work, and this will be very, very clear on my in the photo gallery on my website, in case you're, um, you know, it's in high JPG, so you can see it there. Beautiful. Thank you, Ruby. I know we we said we would be done at nine o'clock. Did we say nine? We did. I, we, I think people are feeling a little shy. We don't we don't have any uh, any more questions. So mm -hmm. I think if if you have any more questions, Gail, that's fine. It's also oh, I always have more questions. Ruby, how do you decipher fact from fiction as an historian through the fog of four hundred years erasure, palace gossip, romanticism, orientalism? How do you decipher what is truth and what is fiction? Yeah, so you know, uh, here's a here's a very interesting uh, legacy that I come into, uh, which is uh, a legacy that I think many feminist historians would share. Which is the kind of work I did, starting with my first book on the on the on the on the harem life, then Indian girl child, and then this book. You know, in my first book, I was told, uh, "How are you going to do this domesticity and domestic life and charting a history of the harem?" We have no sources for it okay uh, and at that time uh, you know I found the uh, the only prose chronicle not only from the time of the Mughals but from the entire Islamic world um, uh, by this princess called Gulbadan or Princess Rosebody who was the daughter of the first Mughal aunt of the second and uh, I'm sorry sister of the second and aunt of Akbar the Great uh, and when Akbar the Great builds the Haram uh, palace. She's, you know, she's not going to take it. 
and she leads an all women's pilgrimage to Mecca. A lot happened there. I'm writing a biography now, but there was that chronicle to come back to. Okay. And that is the kind of chronicle historians had dismissed as, uh, again, we know all these things as soft society of women, or oh, it's called these women's intimate you know, details, or oh, it's poetry, it's this, it's that. So I mentioned this because there is this whole issue in front of us uh, about what constitutes as the grounds of history writing. What are the grounds uh, you know, I want to tread? What do I want to use? Uh, I believe, uh, you know, even just because a chronicle centers on a king, on an emperor, does not by definition make it legitimate, right? Uh, so to give you another example of that battle in which the word such as fitna is used for her, which is really, you know, rendering her chaotic and really the beginning of her erasure. Uh, at that point, there's a court poet, uh, a man called Mullah Kami Shirazi, who writes a hundred pages of beautiful poetry. Um, uh, and these are preserved in the Aligarh Muslim Library in, in, in Northern India. Um, and the, the, the Masnavi, which is written in the same mode as, as Rumi, the great Rumi. And historians had classified this as, as panegyric. Now in a courtly world, what is not panegyric, right? So I take all of these grounds of history writing, but I also took the legends on board because the legends were really so incredible. I was, if I was going to take this book to the public, I was really concerned about what the public believed or felt it knew about Nur Jahan. And the legends are absolutely uh, incredible. So the book that I write, because I think in taking on the legends, you're taking on the history of public imagination side by side, by the side of the record, right? Uh, and the and the and the record is very rich, as as I've been telling you. I mean, there's poetry, there are the chronicles, there are histories, there's art. None of this was easy. I mean, Mughal art, for instance, you know, I mean, this is not an insertion. There, there's, you have to understand the language of this, of this art. Why is she holding the musket? You know, how do we know uh, that, you know, this is she? Uh, you know, why is the armpits looking dark? What's the technicality around it, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you know? Um, and I uh, really, uh, I think I have to say that fabulous art historians, uh, Kathy Benkheim, Molly Atkin, Sonia Mays, uh, amazing art historians who really held my hand um, and led me into it. Um, but I did really, uh, obviously, I have a judgment here, uh, right? Um, there's a judgment around, uh, there were other challenges, right? I mean, I did not have books in which, so, you know, one very important um, uh, idea in the book, uh, and this is to go back to your question about how did she become possible, is also because Jahangir, her husband, actually breaks from everything that her fa his father does, right? He comes out of the palace wall. He's one of the most peripatetic king. They live in tents all the way through. Now, one of the things I had to do starting from 1611 to 27, they're traveling. They're pitching tents everywhere. And I had to draw these itineraries of movement, which were crazy. I did not have one social history that gave me, you know, the itineraries of um, the wonderful itineraries of Jahangir. So if anybody wants to do a PhD with me on that, you know, please come let me know. But, but you know, that was quite a job because, again, he was writing in a stream of consciousness style. Now you've reached this far, okay, are we back in the same town? The, the, the towns have gone out of modern maps. The rivers have different names. So Ruby, what happens to Nur Jahan after she is widowed for the second time? Uh, you know, I think I partly gave that answer. I think um, my image of Nur Jahan is that she'll have to use a modern feminist uh, wonderful visual. She'll have rolled up her sleeves and carried on doing whatever it is that she was doing, which is that, you know, she builds her husband's mausoleum, which is really quite unparalleled because he says uh, in his uh, last wishes that he wanted his mausoleum constructed in such a way that he was directly linked with the divine. And there was no parallel in mausoleum building of that. So what, what she does is this mausoleum in Lahore 
it has these four uh, pillars on the side and it's completely uh, you know, there's, there's this square building or rectangular building, the tomb is inside, and then it's completely open. So, uh, you know, I think, um, so she was very creative, I think very involved uh, in, in um, uh, you know, these, these designs, these... She left the harm, which I found interesting, given her position there and the fact that she was living in a multi-generational type setting. And I would imagine that she had status there. So I know you can't speak to intention, but what might have been the reasons why she would have said, I'm going out on my own now? And what did being on her own look like? Did she take yes. servant with her or was she really alone in a little home like a dowager? Yes. yes, I think the critical question is what was that alone? It is not, you know, living in your apartment on your own. I mean, it's a, it's a mansion she would live in. She would, you know, she would have servants, attendants, uh, you know, people by her side. Uh, you know, she had a daughter, Ladley, uh, whose husband also dies towards the end uh, in the war with the stepson. And there was a granddaughter. The likelihood is she may have brought them with her. Uh, and then she had her, you know, relatives. She had two sisters. Uh, you know, she had uh, a brother. Maybe there was some arrangement whereby you know they met so but these are all the ifs and buts of history but the likelihood is uh, given the uh, familial norm the, given the uh, you know sociability of the time those interactions one way or another uh, you know would have continued the interesting thing is also um, you know uh, that um, her stepson Shah Jahan who builds the Taj Mahal who becomes the next emperor uh, people say that, uh, you know, he he does not mention her in the imperial history, but he has a notification of her death uh, in the imperial history, if I can find it very quickly. It's really quite extraordinary. I'd like to, um, uh, to just read. Um, I'd like to just read from the Shah Jahan Nama, which is... Okay. You know, what is that? So we are on page 220. And so she passes away on November 18, 1645. And um, here's what uh, is written in the imperial history. In the city of Lahore, the Queen Dowager Nur Jahan Begum, whom it is needless to praise as she had already reached the pinnacle of fame, departed to paradise in the 72nd year of her age. The renowned Begum, which means the, it's the honorific for her, was the chaste daughter of Itmadu Dola and sister of late Yaminud Dola. From the sixth year of the late emperor's reign, that is Jahangir, her husband, when she was united to him in the bond of matrimony, she gradually acquired such unbounded influence over his majesty's mind that she seized the reins of government and abrogated to herself the supreme civil and financial administration of the realm, ruling with absolute authority till the conclusion of his reign. So it is well, almost as if people will themselves on to history. Yeah, Ruby, was that a way of calling her a fitna woman? It seemed a little side-eye-ish to me. <laughs> Word like seizing the reins and abrogating herself yes. and supreme power. I don't know. Yes. Was that complimentary yes. or was he jabbing her? Well, uh, you know, he was certainly not fond of her. But my point is that he could not not have her written in this way, right? I mean, he's not saying she was one of his 20 wives and, you know, she's now died and right. all that kind of thing. So, um, so that's, um, you know, that's the last bit we know in terms of uh, textual evidence. So we've had a few more questions come in, uh, and I think one in particular sort of dovetails with Gail's question. So um, this person asked, does Nur Jahan ever give us the sort of sense that Gobadan, Bij I, sorry to butcher his name, Bij Bigum, uh, does in her Humayun Nama that the true locus of public power lay in the harem, that it was the harem senior women who actually controlled the men? So sort of, again, getting at the question of yes. power control. Yes, yes. I, I, you know, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. I think um, 
in a really interesting way, Gulbadan's Prose Chronicle, uh, you know, she, first of all, she turns history upside down, which is to say, by that I mean, uh, you know, most chronicles of the time really centered on, on kings. And here she just turns that around by really inserting women into history. Uh, and it's all about generations of women around her. Uh, none of them are in the harem, by the way, right? I mean, uh, the, the society that she is depicting uh, and the power of women and the, and the negotiations and the arrangements and the arguments is really constantly in movement. And that's where the, uh, the, the, the prose is really, you know, very critical and, uh, and, and, and fairly staggering. Uh, it's, it's also so colloquial. It's so much in the, in the, in the storytelling form. Noor Jahan does a, a variety of things, her life to uh, life story as, as, as I've, um, you know, captured here. Uh, is that she is she grows up in a in an aristocratic mansion, which is a particular kind of upbringing. It's 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 just in in which her father, the great aristocrat, to him the kings would be the model first in Safavid Iran and then in and then in Mughal India, and then of course he rises to the to the top uh, of the of the ladder in our, in aristocracy. Then she gets married and goes to Bengal, which is a very different kind of homescape, if you will, and then she comes to the harem. Uh, but she's really out of the harem very, very quickly. Uh, and that kind of, uh, it seems to me, the way she comes out of the harem uh, and, and reaches uh, the pinnacle of power and, and glory as co-sovereign. I mean, so I've, I've really uh, attempted to launch her as a, as a co-sovereign here. Uh, that I think is very, very different from Gulbadan. And this is, in fact, one of the uh, I find the question very interesting because, um, you know, this is my current struggle. Uh, when we think about power of women, we understand when, with all due respect to Noor Jahan and lots of love for her, you know, we understand this. We, it's easy for us to understand somebody taking on the reins of, of, of government. But how do we understand the power of a 52-year-old woman who strategizes with a group of women and goes on a pilgrimage. Now, what happens on a pilgrimage is a great scandal, right? We have an idea of a pilgrimage. We think, oh, this is, you know, extreme piety. Now she's going to go get some relief. But it's so much more, right? Then she comes back and Akbar, her, her uh, nephew, asks her to write uh, this chronicle as a contribution to the uh, to the imperial history, the great Akbar Nama, but the end of her book breaks off. That's another puzzle I've had. And it's actually, this is a small thing I'll tell now because I'm going to write about this. Uh, the, dis the disappeared part of the book is related to what happened when she was in Western Arabia, right? The question is, how do we understand that power, which is actually cerebral power, right? It's the power of thinking, it's the power of initiative. And I think even to be a sovereign, you've got to think, you've got to strategize, right? So it's, it's how to make that brain power really palpable for myself and for, for the people who are going to read this book. You know, the, these two women represent that. So a follow-up question. Um, what explains the fact that so few historians have written about these great historical figures that you are writing about, such as Nur Jahan and Gobadan? Uh, <laughs> I can give that answer, you know, the answer to that question very, very quickly, <laughs> unlike my other uh, answers. Uh, it's called, uh, I'm calling it male disbelief, which simply means the sources are a problem, when the actions happen, that is a problem, that women can do it is a problem, right? Um, I've been thinking, I'm sure all of you are thinking, um, you know, what happened to all these amazing women candidates that we had, right? What went wrong there? I'm still keeping my fingers crossed. And I think it's really quite, um, it's, it's, it's hard, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say enough. There isn't enough that one can say about how much disbelief there is when it comes to uh, the incredible power and resources uh, of women. Uh, I mean, on Noor Jahan itself, when I was uh, herself, when I was writing, when uh, I was talking to a colleague of mine, and 
I said to him, and um, it is a him. I said to him, you know, she hunted and this happened and this and that. And he said to me three or four times, she hunted? You mean she hunted? And you mean it's recorded? Right? So, so that's what we are talking about. Um, I think, I think it, it, it just challenges a lot around us. It turns, uh, it's a common phrase, it turns our world upside down. Things look very, very different. Um, our next question is, did Nur Jahan compose a divan? And if so, is it extant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. We don't know. Uh, I wondered about that myself. Uh, there's, you know, uh, I have about, uh, I read some some verses to you all together. Uh, you know, uh, at least I know of about 30 uh, such verses. Um, there may have been a divan, but we have no information where the verses are found uh, or other work that people have done, none. And then our final question that we have uh, in the, in the gallery here is, did the curmudgeonly Sir Thomas Rowe make an appearance in your book? Yes, absolutely. And again, you know, some of his, some of his um, uh, writing is just really pretty phenomenal. I mean, he's, he's puzzled. He's, uh, you know, he thinks about Noor Jahan in quite interesting ways because to him, the embodiment of power, to go back to the power, how do different people understand her power, right? To go to the embod what is an embodiment of power when Sir Thomas Rowe comes to the to the court of Jahangir's and follows them around the uh, tented, uh, you know, encampment to the in the in the encampment. Excuse um, me, for people who don't know who Sir Thomas Rowe was, why not tell us and then we'll have context. Sir Thomas Rowe was the ambassador of James I of England, and he goes to the Mughal court to get, uh, uh, you know, uh, trade and other uh, treaty agreements. And Noor Jahan actually keeps his seal overnight, uh, and he's really pissed off because he doesn't like, he, he just feels he should be invited, um, you know, straight away. So, uh, so he writes a lot about Noor and Jahangir. And he tries to view her from the from his own viewpoint, which is the viewpoint of, you know, what did a favorite look like? So in the European courts, you always had a favorite, which was almost always a man. And it, he he the favorite would be a combination of a person who was the advisor, who was the counselor to the king, would be the closest, would be a boon companion, but really in an advisory role. And you know, he says about Noor Jahan, maybe maybe. Uh, this is this is this is her. Uh, in the introductory uh, pages on page thirteen, this is what he wrote uh, while he's following them. I'm yet following this wandering king over mountains and through woods, so strange and unused ways that his own people blaspheme his name and hers. That it is said conducts all his actions. I I fear he will not long stay anywhere where whose course is directed by a woman. And at one point, he calls her the goddess of heathen impiety. I can't uh, pull out the exact page numbers. So it's very, very interesting uh, reflections. Um, and uh, so, you know, once more, um, how to understand these sources within their own contexts and, you know, where they are coming from. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a quack doctor, uh, you know, who writes about her birth. Uh, and this is where this whole legend of uh, her abandonment by her parents, you know, she was born on the road. This is a fact of her history. She was born on the road in 1577 outside Kandahar as her parents were fleeing persecution from Iran and coming to the court of Akbar the Great. Uh, and she's born, uh, you know, in a caravan. Um, and so one of the legends that got generated by uh, by by the 18th century was that her parents were in such bad state that they had to abandon her. Um, and then, you know, the mother gets very desolate and they go back and there's a cobra that's circling around her as soon as he, it sees the parents, the cobra wanders off. So the 10 films that were made on Noor Jahan between 1936 and 67 all have this opening scene of the cobra, you know, wandering around and so on and so forth. But, you know, what are these images? These are, these are, uh, these are people's, and that's why I said public imagination. How do people make sense of, uh, you know, extraordinary figures? 
what what is their language and by that i don't mean hindi urdu english sanskrit by that i mean uh you know the philosophical cultural religious uh you know language within which they can make uh you know sense of power so we have um about five minutes left and i want to make sure that everyone um sees that at the bottom of the screen there should be a button where you can buy the book um, we know that you are going to want to go home with this book. Uh, we, will, we will, well, go home. We wish you could do, we wish we could just hand it to you right now, but um, we will happily send it to you. Uh, and every book that you purchase really does um, help Karis stay, stay alive and thriving in this time. Um, it's also very important to support Ruby's work. Um, the fact that she is um, a groundbreaking historian doing this work and, you know, sort of recuperating the stories of uh, women who have not been known uh, as much as they should be to history uh, is really a big part of Karis's mission. So um, if you get a chance, please do uh, consider buying the book. I want to um, see if there's any other uh, questions or comments, Gail, that you want to offer or elicit um, before we move on. Ruby, how are you thriving? You've been sheltering in place for six weeks now in Atlanta. <laughs> Yes, yeah. that's right. Well, uh, in Midtown Atlanta, uh, in Ansley Park on 15th Street, <laughs> uh, in this apartment, actually, I'm sitting in my study and I'm uh, crafting the early chapters of um, Rebel Princess, the great adventures of Gulbadan. So that's what's happening here. So you're being hyper productive as always. Are you binge watching yeah. trashy TV shows? <laughs> um, I won't. I won't respond to that question. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, you know. I would like to I, Go ahead. I, I I would um I would really like to thank both of you, Gail and Er, and I would I would really like to say please support uh, independent bookstores. Um, buy from Caris or any of your favorites. Um, I've had a great time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Ruby, and thank you, Er. Yeah, thank you both. This was really lovely. Um, the last thing that I'm going to say is um, we are primarily individually donor funded. So Karis is a hybrid. Um, we're both a for-profit bookstore and a nonprofit. And all of our events like this are funded by our nonprofit. So um, our work is to foster sustainable feminist communities, promote the expression of diverse and marginalized voices, and work for social justice. So those three pieces of our mission are um, even more important at this moment, I think. Um, and, and we know that many, many people are donating uh, their money, whatever left they have, to immediate causes of survival. And we really believe in that. But we also believe in um, supporting our cultural centers so that we have something to build from going forward. Um, because as with your work, Ruby, it's so important that we have, um, have our stories preserved. So um, we, it looks like we may be losing Ruby's video feed a little bit, but, um, hopefully she can still hear us. I just want to thank all of you who are, um, watching from home or listening from home. It's always lovely to, um, be in conversation, to have you participating in the chats. This will immediately become, um, live so you can rewatch it. You can share it with your friends. Um, if folks are just waking up in India that you have, uh, relatives or friends in India, please share it with them. Um, and let folks know about it. We would love, love, love um, for more people to see this. It will be available um, transcribed with closed captioning on YouTube uh, probably within a week or two. Um, we're trying to turn these around as quickly as possible. And, um, and as always, please check out um, Ruby's website and Gail's work as well. So thank you both. We are so grateful. Have a very good and safe night. Thank you, ER. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you, Ruby. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.